This is the stuff dreams are made of. I'm writer collector Ryan Condal. And I'm writer collector Dave Mandel. Hey, Ryan, how are you? I'm really good, Dave. Uh, I'm it's very happy a, to see you today. I'm very, I'm always very happy to see you. I do, I've really, I have to say, I've come to really look forward to our, our Sunday meetings. It's all I can do to sort of like, there are definitely times where I'm like, oh, I'm not going to text him. I'll just save it for Sunday. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, I don't know what to do if we actually have a real conversation at this yeah. point. So yeah. it's just here. I, I did we'll not know I was carry going... dummy microphones around. To yeah, just exactly. And just, we're, hi, Ryan, how are you? <laughs> uh, I wasn't a hundred percent sure I was actually going to see you today. We had no power here in Los Angeles. We were having another one of these, uh, insane storms we lost power yesterday afternoon it came back on 6 a.m this morning i'm watching so actually, i can't believe yeah. this stuff it I, is I lived, wild snow I, sleet hail yeah. it's crazy yeah i lived in la for 15 years and I, I i know we had some rainy winters but i can't remember anything like what i mean i haven't been there but like what's i moved been going out here on. in 95 and it used to start raining in december and it would rain many many days december january february mm. into march it would rain we had rain but it was normal rain like you just kind of went it's raining and everyone like like didn't know how to drive and everything like that but it was normal <laughs> yeah. rain these are like catastrophic storms that are like knocking out power and taking down trees and clogging yeah. up and i mean uh, uh, shots of burbank with people's like cars like uh, i mean yeah. I, I just don't know what we're doing here but anyway um hi <laughs> uh yeah how's it going uh <laughs> yeah. we, we have a we have a mega sized epi epic episode we have a mega sized tonight. episode and in perfect uh relation to that i have a mega sized box that has shown up at my ah. condo that is the bane of my existence because as everyone who's been listening knows i've had this crazy condo flood and it, it's just a nightmare still. nothing to and do I'm, with the weather I'm, in la no nothing That's to do with the weather it's not just to do with a idiot who doesn't know how to flush a toilet upstairs from me or something but mm. uh, or tries to flush everything down the toilet i guess is the larger issue but anyway so i, I you know how does one say this obviously my place is a little bit like a, sh a shipping uh you know terminal and i am now paying the 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 price for all of these things that i've ordered over the last year and kind of forgot about and now there's no room to put anything in my place it's just like nuts and these things keep showing up and I'm trying not to buy new, but these things were ordered at whatever time. And so this giant box from Toshin has shown up. Um, uh, multiple giant boxes have shown up, but this one is giant, giant. And um, it is, it is literally, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure what it is, but it also, and so it is the bane of my existence, but I'm also thrilled it's there. But uh, in some ways, that is my what's new in props is this giant box that I feel is like the boulder in Indiana Jones sort of chasing me around my condo, if you can imagine. And it's just it's fucking insane. And I believe what is in it is this incredible, insanely new Toshin Shining book that is, I don't know, just huge. And I can't wait to read it. But I guess in some ways I am going to have to do more work in the apartment before I even have the room to open this box <laughs> open is the honest answer. And then you'll so need I to do more is, work so yes, you can to open read the it, book. to lay it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I feel like this is some carrot stick thing. Um, but it is sort of a perfect uh, introduction to this show um, because we are lucky enough to have with us the writer, or I guess is he the co-writer or the writer? I don't know what his actual credit yeah, is. Yeah, well, I think I mean, yeah. I think they're I think they're kind of you know him and uh, so so Leon Critch, uh, a Pixar director, editor, uh, uh, story breaker. He's, he was there for for twenty five years, as we'll talk about. Um, uh, co, I guess, co, co produced, co created the book with, uh, the great, uh, late, uh, Jonathan Rinsler, JW Rinsler. And it was a collaboration of theirs. Um, Leah talks about how all that, uh, all that worked, but it was sort of his kind of brainchild. And Jonathan was working on a separate, um, but, but similar making of the shining project in parallel. And then they joined forces and out of it came a, uh, 13 year long, uh, project and a, like, uh, 3000 pound. <laughs> yeah. Multi-volume. Monstrosity. Uh, wonderful, book, wonderful, which wonderful monstrosity. I will yeah. also do as my what's new in props because I got an email uh, earlier this week from Toshin and I got all excited because I've been waiting for this book to ship. And it was a, unfortunately due to the complexities of, uh, producing this volume, there have been some production delays, and uh, the books will now come in early March. So it sounds like London maybe gets their books or Europe gets their books a little later uh, than you. If that is indeed 
uh, what you what you bought, and I mean, or what what's waiting for you in your. I believe your, it is. It is yeah. too big for anything else, but I guess we'll find out in another yeah. episode. But uh, with that as an introduction, uh, let us uh, please, please put your hands together and give a That's nice right. uh, a nice prop store, uh, a nice prop store, a nice stuff. Dreams are made. Do, of. Might as well sponsor, they do sponsor us. I know. Uh, with that in mind, put your hands together and give a nice stuff that dreams are made of. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, the author or one of the authors of uh, the Shining book. Uh, Lee Unkrich. Well, welcome to the podcast, uh, Lee Unkrich, uh, who kind of needs no introduction, but we will introduce him anyway. Uh, he spent uh, 25 years <laughs> at Pixar. What if we uh, just Pixar. did no introduction? What <laughs> just, if we just, just, just jumped skip right it. in? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody just, knows who I am. Just presume. Um, but he's, uh, he's uh, a 25-year alum at Pixar. He began as an editor uh, and uh, directed uh, uh, smash hits, uh, Toy Story 3 and Coco, among others. Um, and uh, tons and tons of work there, which I'm sure we will talk about. And uh, as as you might have guessed so far, based on the uh, things we talked about earlier and the title of the podcast, this is one that's all about The Shining. And I think Lee qualifies as the uh, the primo aficionado of the of The Shining, at least as far as the uh, book writing and collecting world go. I would say maybe the the living expert on The Shining yeah. is that fair? Lee? According to the Hollywood Reporter, that's what I am. So I'll take it. Well, okay. Very good. If it's good enough for them, it, yeah. it's good enough for the wow. stuff dreams are made. Yeah. <laughs> impressed, um, just really impressed. But, the Hollywood Reporter, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for uh, thank you for joining us. It's it's really cool to uh, to have you on. We're both big fans of your of your of your work, both as a um, as a director and now as a, uh, a published author as well. So oh, very thank exciting. you. Thank and you. allow yeah, me. I'll, I'll throw in on top of that. I am a fan as both a father of children who were entertained mm. but also me 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 myself so like i would have seen, i saw yeah. these are movies unlike a lot of you know forgive me animated stuff that i have no interest in like i'm only going you know put the kids in and take a nap kind of a thing god yeah i so enjoyable I, yeah i fell asleep on the couch during many animated films when yeah. my kids were growing up and so i kind of vowed to try to never have that happen with our films you know what? Well, you've that's, done, that's actually yeah. Well done. You've yeah. done great because this is kind of two generations of of uh, parents of children talking to you. So my girls are very young; they're seven and five, so they're kind of doing all this stuff. The first blush of all this stuff. They're obsessed with Toy Story now. They're obsessed with uh, Turning Red. Um, uh, they're obsessed with uh, Monsters Inc. There are lots of Monsters Inc. on. So I've become kind of I can hear the dialogue now in my head. I'm I'm quoting it just <laughs> as much as I often quote Star Wars to them. So um, thank you for that because some of the stuff that they watch is is not quite as good. <laughs> Let's just say, but uh, yes, very very appreciative of the hours of uh, entertainment, particularly on long plane rides from uh, London back to the United States. Um, so, uh, so Lee, you've, you kind of began your career. I mean, you were very young when you started at, at Pixar has entertainment, um, and filmmaking always been, uh, the plan for you since as far as you can remember, are you, are you one of us? Yes. I, you know, I went to, um, yeah, I mean, I grew up loving movies and, and it was the shining actually seeing the shining that first piqued my interest in how movies were made. And, um, dove deeply into that and ultimately ended up going to film school at USC. So, oh, wow. uh, I, I was there. Um, Did I left you USC. know when you went to film school, were you interested in animation or you just went to film school? You were interested in cinema, if you will. Okay, yeah. cool. I didn't have anything against animation. No, no, I know. But, no, yeah. yeah. But it wasn't my thing. Um, uh, not very much into, uh, getting into live action and, uh, my first, work getting out of film school was uh, as an editor in in television and i had dreams of uh, editing features at some point and, and you know possibly directing if 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 uh, you know i could make that happen but i ended up getting a call from pixar one day um and they needed someone to help get ready for a screening at disney for jeffrey katzenberg of the original toy story and uh and i went up and i got the job and it was supposed to be like a four to six week job and I uh, ended up staying for the next 25 years. That's amazing. But on that same, just, they renewed you every four to six weeks, right? They just kept well, renewing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing was, you know, when I got there, I really, I was worried because I don't know anything about animation and I really didn't know anything about editing animation. Um, but the more time I spent with them and seeing what they were doing, I came to realize, you know, I have to remember no one had been making 
CG features prior to Toy Story. It was the first one. And so when I took a good look at how it all worked and how the sausage was made, um, I realized that what they were doing was kind of more akin to live action than traditional animation had been. And so uh, I found that I could bring all of my skills as a live action director and editor to bear to help them, uh, you know, create the films. And I think that's a big reason why I ended up moving from editing to directing as quickly as I did at Pixar, although I continued editing all the way till the day I left the studio. In certain ways, having done a little bit of both and not a lot of animation, but a little bit, um, more so the, I mean, certainly all editing is obviously, you know, that famous story you write, you know, you make the movie three times, you write it, you make it, then you edit it, you know, you make it three times. But in animation, the ability to truly just like make a shot that you maybe didn't have. And again, I'm talking about animation that isn't as good. So you have, you're just like, you know, desperately going, oh my God, we need a shot here. And the ability to make it even more so than I, I guess I found in regular editing, where obviously you can do a lot of miracles of live action. It felt like you could completely reconstruct, rewrite and redirect even that much more so. And that how important editing was in animation. That that, that was my Absolutely. baby I mean, take on about, things. Yeah. You talk about making the movie three times. I mean, at Pixar, we probably, you know, make the movie, you know, a few hundred times. In the course of making, we're constantly <laughs> ripping it apart. We're constantly rewriting. Yeah. And all the way through the bitter end of, you know, laying out the movie and doing all the staging and camera work. I mean, it's a constantly evolving process and we're able to kind of fine tune and, and make adjustments that, you know, you just really couldn't do in live action. So I got kind of addicted to the freedom and the, the, and not having to compromise really on anything. I mean, anything I could dream up, I could make sure it was the way I wanted it to be in the finished film while still at the same time, you know, collaborating with a, a ton of really, really talented people and, and, you know, enjoying everything that they brought to bear in the creation of the films. Were you cutting uh, on film when you started and then went over to, di no, it was, it was, it was fully did no, even the TV the work that you're doing. Yeah, that's part of why I got the job. Um, when I was finishing grad school at USC, um, the avid media composer was just coming out into the world. Nothing had really cut on it yet. And they set up a lab at USC uh, where they could kind of train live action editors and get them interested in using it. And in exchange for that, having that lab, students, if they got trained, were allowed to kind of be in that lab. So I took to it like a duck to water and um, really dove in deep because I was kind of, I was as much a film geek as I was kind of a computer geek. And so I just, I just really loved the, the, the control that I had and, and just, it was so exciting to be using such a new tool. Um, so I got a lot of work quickly after school because there weren't many people who knew the Avid. And, and that's actually what brought me up to Pixar because they, they were making what was going to be the first entirely digital film and they, they didn't want to edit it on film. They wanted right. to edit it digitally as well. Yeah. So yeah. they brought me up as somebody who really knew uh, the system and then ended up getting in me somebody who, uh, you know, they felt was a, a, a great filmmaker as well. When I, uh, when I first started, uh, at Saturday night live at, in the Saturday night live building because of the unions and whatnot, Avid existed, but they weren't allowed to use it. So it was always like, you know, like tape to tape editing with like an editor who called the edit, but he didn't touch the machine. He told another guy and that guy worked the machine. And there was a third guy who was the only one that was allowed to touch the tapes, you know, the, like, like basically it was, like, it, it was, it was just madness. And you would just, you know, you'd edit and just pray you were right because there was of course no going back. And I remember the first time that oof. I got to work on an avid and it was just like, Oh my God, I can go back and change something. This is, this is, yeah. Yeah. And even what you know when I started on the Avid, it was still an extremely expensive system, and you know hard drives were really expensive and <laughs> I dreamed of someday being able to do that on a laptop and of course, you know we're there now, and we've been there a while i've I've sat on international flights editing Pixar movies wow that's lucky amazing. lucky kid that got to sit next <laughs> to you on that flight and sort yeah. of like, oh, what's that oh toy Story three nice, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, they thought so, you were doing the the like YouTube fan edit of uh, of you know 
I'm going to, I'm going to change it all around and make the voices different. They thought you were some like, <laughs> well, to be clear, when I was on the planes, I was pretty much editing dialogue. Cause I, yeah, mm. I couldn't have people looking at my screen. So yeah. I was diving into other stuff. So, <laughs> cause we had to be so secretive, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, so you mentioned the, your, your kind of the origin of you falling in love with the film is seeing the shining. How old were you? <laughs> When you saw when you saw the shining for the first time, I was twelve. Okay, so your parents oh. took you, or you went. My mom took me. I was twelve. I was almost thirteen. Were you into yeah. horror? Were you into Stephen King? What were you? Were you into this stuff, or it was just a movie? I was starting to get into scary things, like any kid that age uh, does. Um, I grew up seeing a lot of movies. My mom liked going to the movies and I think my dad never really wanted to go. And so my mom ended up taking me along to a lot of sure. films that I was, I know I was like way too young to see. Like, I think I saw dog day afternoon when I was in third grade and <laughs> you know, I, she just kind of took me to whatever. That, I, I, in your mom's defense, that is the perfect age to see dog day afternoon for, for our <laughs> listeners with little kids. It really, you want second or third grade is ideal because I don't know, older than that, you start to question anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then, you know, as I, I got a little older, like any kid, I, I was into anything spooky and interesting. And um, my mom had regretted about a year before The Shining, she took me to see a movie called It Lives Again, which was the sequel to It's Alive. It was okay. a Larry Cohen film in the in the okay. kind of mid to late 70s. And it freaked the hell out of me. Like, I, I, honest to God, no exaggeration, had nightmares for a year after I saw it, like recurrent, horrible nightmares. And I, I mean, I couldn't even like if a, a trailer, a commercial for a horror film came on TV, I, I had to run and change the channel. Like I was so traumatized by that film. So I don't know what my mom was thinking, you know, at, at 12 when uh, she took me to The Shining, but she did. I didn't know anything about it. I actually the only thing I remember about seeing it that first time was her turning to me at some point and asking if I was OK. Because I think she was, you know, she she didn't want to right. have another. Did I make the same mistake again? Yeah. <laughs> but I remember just this feeling of being just entranced and and being so drawn into the film. Um, and I thought about it for days afterwards. And it was a few days after seeing the film. My mom was driving me to a summer camp, and we stopped at a gas station. And I went in to get candy or something. And there was a, a rack of paper books. Uh, sorry, a rack of paperback books. And on that rack was the movie tie-in edition of The Shining with, you know, the yellow Saul Bass um, mm. logo. And so I bought it and I ended up just like reading it voraciously all summer. And I recognized right away that it was different than the movie. That but... was my question. It was the just simply the repackaged story. They never did. I, I honestly didn't know that. I wasn't sure. They never did a quote unquote novelization. Adaptation, no, no, novelization. No no, 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 no. It was just simply new cover on the old. OK, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. Stephen King's novel. And um, I I loved it, too. I, I loved both. Um, the, the, but the thing is I could keep reading the book again and again, but I couldn't keep seeing the movie because this is before home video, right. you know, it was just about to happen. So I saw the movie that one time and, you know, eventually my, my mom bought a Betamax deck, a Sony Betamax and, you know, the first video store started to open and I basically started, you know, waiting until the shining would come out on video and it finally did. But you know, it was a weird time at video stores. They were trying to figure out the business. And a lot of the studios at first would release titles only for rental. Like you couldn't buy them. Right. And they were really expensive. And so I had to keep waiting. And then finally they, they brought out the rental version and uh, I brought it home and started watching it endlessly. So along with the Stephen King book, did it send you down a, a Kubrick sort of I don't know, not wormhole, but you know what I mean? Like, did you, as you were interested in Slipstream. film, did you start to kind of go like, well, who are these people? Who's Stanley Kubrick? I need to, and again, to whatever extent you could, uh, again, without video rentals, obviously, but like, I don't know, uh, revival theaters or what? And like, were you making an effort to go down those no. paths as well? No, shining, shining, not shining. In, yeah. Not until it came out on video because um, I just didn't have access to right. anything, right? So when it came out on video, which wasn't, I mean, it was maybe a year later, I'm guessing, I don't really remember. Um, you know, I started watching it again and again. And at that point, you know, I started, you know, I don't even know how I looked up anything without the internet <laughs> at that point, but I became aware that Stanley Kubrick had uh, other films. And so I sought them out 
rented them and loved them. And a weird thing happened when I watched Stanley's other films is I started to sense like echoes of The Shining in these earlier films in terms of his style, you know, the, the style mm. of performances, his use of music and sound design, the compositions. I felt The Shining in the DNA of those other films. So that is really the first time I can remember thinking about the fact that there could be an artist behind a film. Because mm. prior to The Shining, even though I saw lots of movies, they were just entertainment. That's all I thought of them as. And The Shining was the first time I started thinking about, um, you know, what went on behind the camera and the fact that there there could be a singular voice kind of um, creating the work, ultimately. What's always were fascinating any... to me... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Ron. Yeah, I was just going to ask, were there any movie magazines around at the time where you were able to dig into the behind the scenes stuff? You know, was, uh, you know, I mean, Cine Fantastique probably doesn't exist quite yet at this point. Maybe, maybe they do because they were around in the early 80s. But I don't even know, did they even cover The Shining? Because it's one of those movies that sort of falls in the it's it's genre but it wasn't you know it wasn't like creature genre or or science fiction or fantasy and i'm just curious what what would have been available at right. the time in terms of like behind the scenes stuff yeah there wasn't much and I, but i did everything i could to find anything you know <laughs> i i would look and look up um you know on microfiche find like magazine articles cuz it was on the cover of i think people at the time and mm -hmm. uh, i think newsweek had a cover story and so i would like I would like borrow uh, magazines from other libraries and, and have them come to my library so I could re so I could read them. The only kind of behind the scenes thing I could ever get my hands on was uh, an issue of American Cinematographer. Oh, oh and cool. The Shining was the cover story um, because The Shining had this like really innovative use of the Steadicam. It was the first major use of right. the Steadicam. Right. And uh, so they did a pretty in-depth article about Garrett Brown and the Steadicam. And they talked with John Alcott, the DP as well. Um, and so that was kind of a tantalizing glimpse into the making of the film. Um, the other thing that happened at some point is in looking at my, no my novel of The Shining, the movie tie-in, there were a bunch of photos in the center of the book, uh, black and white stills. And at some point, I realized that one of the stills was a scene that I didn't remember being in the film. Mm. It was a, an image of Wendy um, cooking breakfast in the kitchen in a bathrobe. And once I realized that, I, I put the tape in and I fast forwarded and rewound and I couldn't find that shot anywhere. And so that got my mind thinking, wow, if there was stuff shot that isn't in the movie, was there more? <laughs> so that was the beginning of me trying to get my hands on a screenplay. Um, and I also heard at some point, I don't remember how I heard this, but I had heard about the fact that there had originally been an epilogue on The Shining. Um, and that Stanley had cut it out of the film just a few days after the film was released in limited release in L.A. and New York. He actually sent editors around in a limo to go from theater to theater and cut the this chunk out of the end of the movie, <laughs> which is crazy. Like, I've never heard of anything like that ever happening uh, and otherwise. What, and what the epilogue was years later or what was it or, or just? No, every, it, no. Was, um, it was a scene of. Uh, Stuart Ullman, played by Barry Denon, um, the, the the manager that we see at the beginning of the movie who interviews Jack. Gives him the job, yeah. He shows up at a hospital and he has a little interaction with Danny out by the nurse's station. And then he goes into a room where Wendy is. And um, I'm already telling you more than I knew about it then. I just sure, knew sure. that yeah. there was a, a hospital scene at the end of the movie that he had cut out. And so I became intrigued with that. I was able to order a screenplay from a script house, like mail <laughs> order. And when it showed up, I was disappointed because it turned out to be a post-production screenplay that was just literally a transcription of the yeah. finished film. Yeah. So, I, you know, I was on the hunt for things for a long time, but there was nothing to be found. And so I grew up, I went through high school, um, you know. Were you going to like memorabilia conventions or like film poster things or anything like that? Were you like anything like, no, nothing like that. So you were no. really just kind of working through magazines and classifieds in the back of magazines. Yeah, as you I mean, found what are you yeah, going to yeah. do? Yeah, yeah. There was, there was no internet. I think I, I did get a poster at some point. Um, but yeah, they're just, I, you know, my hands were tied pretty much. And when I got to film school, USC has a, you know, an amazing film library and uh, adjacent to that is a, is a huge library of just screenplays. And so of course I looked up the shining right away and, and um, 
they had unfortunately that same post production screenplay, but mm. they also had uh, a treatment. They had an early oh. treatment. Oh, cool! And um, that was really cool to read because it was clearly very early on. There were a lot of things in it that weren't in the finished film. Um, I now know what it was, and I know where it was in the timeline of developing the film. But at the time, that again was a tantalizing glimpse into the creation of this movie that I loved. That that sorry that sort of rough outline, whatever you want to call it, closer to the novelization, or or it's still its own thing, or kind of it was somewhere... kind of bridging. It was gotcha. kind of bridging the two. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, there were things in it that were in the book, but there were a lot of things that weren't like sure. new frightening moments. It wasn't even a treatment per se. It was more like one scene per page, kind of uh, very succinct. And was um, that, was that authored story. by Kubrick at all? Or was that, was that the, forgive me, I forget the screenwriter on The Shining. Diane Johnson. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. they, they did everything together. Um, uh, and then Stanley ended up later continuing to write on his own. Um, that treatment was came out of the work that Stanley and Diane were doing together. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Because he, he hadn't done very much when he, um, you know, started the adaptation. He had made a lot of notes on the galleys of Stephen King's novel before it was published, and then later a, a copy of the published book. But they were really starting from scratch when he uh, started working with Diane. Hmm. I I have to ask this question those notes do those exist in copy or in the kubrick archives or anything like that like a la sort of the coppola godfather uh where he wrote into it does that all still exist they do uh, but before i talk about that i'll oh, just sorry. give yeah. you the last part of my journey yeah please please i wasn't i wasn't was... trying to leap over the journey no, no, no. i apologize yeah <laughs> so i you know i go through film school i end up at pixar and at some point, I think around the time I was making Toy Story 2, I seem to remember. I don't know if it's right, though. Um, I, you know, I would any anything I could find out on the Internet. I was doing lots of searching and finding little bits and bobs and old articles and interviews. I was gathering everything and I would sometimes find a photo I'd never seen. Uh, I just had these all in folders on my computer. And at some point, I, you know, people were starting to blog. And I thought, well, I'm going to make a blog. I'm going to start putting this stuff up because if there's just one other person who loves this movie as much as I do, then, you know, maybe they'll be happy to find this. But I also thought if I put this up, maybe someone will approach me who has something I haven't seen. Right. So I started my website, which ultimately became the, the overlookhotel.com. And it was just kind of a clearinghouse for anything having to do with The Shining that I was interested in. So I did that for several years and uh, some people did approach me. Um, a guy who was the cameraman on the title sequence, all the helicopter footage reached out to me, Jeff Blith. And, you know, he told me amazing stories. And, um, and it, so over time, you know, not, I didn't get a ton of new things, but I did get new things. And of course, Stanley Kubrick died in 1999 and some years later, his family donated all of his archives to the London College of Communications, um, you know, so they could house a kind of a public archive that scholars and students could visit. And um, I really wanted to go, of course. I wanted to see what they had to do with The Shining. So when I was finishing Toy Story 3, I knew I was going to be on a press tour and I would be going through London. So I reached out to the um, to the Kubrick archive and explained who I was and why I wanted to visit. And they ultimately uh, granted me permission to come. So I tacked on like three days at the end of my Toy Story 3 press in London. Mm -hmm. And I just hung out in the archive all day for three days. And it, all I could do in those three days was just skim the surface of what right. they had having to do with The Shining. Suddenly, the, 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 these answers, um, all of these things that I had been craving literally for decades was right there in front of me. Everything from, you know, these early galleys with Kubrick's notes on them, every draft of the screenplay, f many photos I'd never seen, props, um, just, you know, continuity Polaroids, all kinds of stuff. And so I was in love. I was smitten, as you can imagine. And it was maybe two years later that I reached out to Jan Harlan, uh, who's Stanley's brother-in-law and was the executive producer of The Shining. And I, I approached him with the idea of doing a book on the making of The Shining. Because by that point, a lot had been written about The Shining, kind of interpretations, analysis, but there was still very little about the actual making of the film. And so I thought that uh, this would be an opportunity to put that book in the world. Um, even though my ulterior motive was that I just wanted to have access right, to all exactly, of the yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you yeah. may not deliver the book, but you get to at least research it. Yeah. Yes. So to answer your earlier question, yes, all of that is there. Um, some of the materials are in this traveling Stanley Kubrick exhibit that's been traveling the world yeah. for yeah, that a was long that was now. here in LA. A LA. Gazillion yeah. So years I ultimately ago. got yeah. access to that while it was in LA, and they okay. let me take out a bunch of screenplays and documents and have them scanned for my research. That's amazing. That's great. That's amazing. Was it? Was did um, you? Oh, I was just going to ask. In, I was in, just in, curious how the the Toshin thing came together. But was oh. that was that always was that always the plan, or or did it? Well, I, did it take I, a circuitous I, you know, route? I was aware of the fact that Tashin had been doing. Uh, I think at that point, just one book. They had published the Stanley Kubrick Archives. Mm -hmm. They'd done this kind of big coffee table book about that. Just again skims the surface of what's actually in the archives, um, but kind of going through every one of his films beautiful book. And there was some stuff from The Shining there that I had never seen. This is prior to me going to the archive. Um, so when I pitched the idea of doing this book, um, it was always with the intention of approaching Tashin and seeing if they were interested. Um, and, you know, they had subsequently done a book on the making of Napoleon, you know, the book, the movie he never right, the made. The not making of Napoleon, exactly. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they had done this big, beautiful book. And then, um, you know, then I heard they were doing a, a 2001, 2001 book as well. Yeah. So it made sense for Tashin to do it. Um, Tashin was kind of uh, tepid at first, um, mostly because they, I think they wanted to see how the 2001 book was going to do before they committed to me. Um, but the other thing that happened when I reached out to Yan was he said, oh, great. Yes, wonderful. We'd love to see a book on the making of The Shining. Um, the problem is I was just approached by someone else who wants to do a book on the making of The Shining. And I thought, wow, that's just great. <laughs> like after all this, like someone else is going to get this. So I said, look, let me, why don't you reach out to this person and, and see if they might be interested in a collaboration. So uh, he did, and they were interested, and it turned out to be Jonathan Rinsler. Rinsler. Yeah, I knew where that story uh, yeah. was going. Yeah, that's Who wonderful. He writes under yeah. J.W. Rinsler, and uh, at the time, he was still working for Lucasfilm, and you know he'd done a number of big coffee table books on the making of the first Star Wars films and Indiana Jones. He later did Alien and Aliens, um, and it turned out he lived in the Bay Area. San Francisco Bay Area, where I live. So I invited him to lunch at Pixar, and we hit it off immediately. Had a great long lunch and uh, knew that we could do this together. As I'd never written a book before, I wasn't an author, and I had a lot of research already under my belt. That and he was starting with nothing. So we, um, you know, we shook hands and that was it. And we set off on on making this book, not knowing that you know how many years it was going to end up taking. Yeah. Um, what year was later, that? Um, well, I reached out to Yan in 2012. So wow. it would have been that okay. same year, probably, that I um, I was going to say, Jonathan. and there's no reason you would know this, but I, the, our listeners maybe know it. I don't even know if they know it. Um, so I wrote the Ralph McQuarrie book that under Jonathan and was spending at that point lots of time both with him, both physically, because I was constantly going up there, but also, mm -hmm. you know, just a lot of email and whatnot. And he was, you know, figuring out he definitely was looking to, you know, other things. And it's funny because I can remember on his list of ideas at some point, I can remember him talking about the shining. And then I can remember him ah. saying, there's this other guy. And ah, I, and, and at some point he probably said like, there's this other guy. He's one of the Pixar guys or something like that. And then at some point I, I am at least aware of the concept of you guys were teaming up. That's all. That's mm -hmm. probably the last thing I really remember, but it's so funny. I do remember sort of that sequence of the shining was on his dream list well you know when yeah, he was, was thinking his, about absolutely yeah. yeah yeah it was his dream to write about a kubrick film yeah um so i worked with him I, i'm guessing it was around seven years in total wow. on this um you know and you know anyone who's a fan of jonathan knows that sadly um he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer not long after he finished writing uh, the text um and he was only given two to three months to live he ended up living about a year afterwards yeah. but we ultimately lost him so yeah. it was tragic it yeah. kills me that he didn't get to see this. He yeah. only saw the very first pass at layouts of the book um, before he passed away. Um, but, uh, you know, I dedicated the book to him. Um, it's just, it's just, it's heartbreaking um, because I, this was his dream to write a, a Kubrick book. Yeah. It was going to be yeah. kind of the, the piece de resistance of his great career. And, uh, but he didn't live to see it. 
I was going to just simply I, say I was oh, also collaborating yes. with with Jonathan uh, on uh, on something uh, that didn't come to fruition. Uh, so I got I was just a huge fan of his because I I read everything every word that he had written in the making of World, and um, I'm, Dave and I are both very good friends with Brandon Allinger, who you know also collaborated mm -hmm. with Jonathan, and um, he kind of put us together and we were working on this thing, and then it, it, he just called me one day and gave me the news. And I still I I never met him face to face because I was living out here. It was the pandemic. He was in. He was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Northern California. And so we just mm -hmm. spoke on the phone all the time. But it was just it was so exciting for me to just, you know, be there in that sphere. And it was just it was such a shame and, and just yeah, really heartbreaking. Yeah. But it's just it's so great how much he touched the kind of film geek community. I mean, it's really you. D it's hard to meet somebody that's serious about certainly films of that I era. I want to jump in on that word serious for three seconds. What I, what my experience with him on the Macquarie book, and there's a million ways you can do the Macquarie book, and whether you like it or not, the way we went about it because of Jonathan, I, I, I take zero credit. It was all Jonathan, but we treated Ralph Macquarie, I, I guess to some extent, like he was Leonardo da Vinci, and this was going to simply be. This is how we're going to do it. This is the work. And we're not going by movie and we're not going whatever. We're going chronologically the way you would treat an artist. And it just, I can't explain it, but it just, it, it, the seriousness with which we approached it because of him and his guidance that made it, yes, it's a movie book, but I feel like that's what's true about all his books, which is they are making of books, but we've seen making of books before, but he just brings a almost like an academic rigor to mm -hmm. the, to the analysis. And that, that's what I'll always remember about him is sort of, again, the word serious was so such a wonderful word that he just took it all so seriously that it wasn't just a, like the kind of making of book that they would, you know, shit out in the eighties. You know what I mean? Right. Where here's 20 pictures and, you know, here's the official story and nothing else and nothing but I, I, I that was, I, I know that's what always sticks with me about him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I'm happy. I'm glad. I mean, thank God he had finished writing the text. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I really don't know what I would have done. I guess I would have figured something out. But um, he, you know, he did a number of drafts. You know, his first draft was probably a third again longer than what we ended up with. <laughs> um, but it was very much a collaboration. I mean, he was doing all the writing, but um, I was constantly reviewing stuff and, you know, fact checking and we would talk about things structurally and, um emphasis and all kinds of things. Uh, um, but it is him. I mean, this book is him. The, the text is Jonathan. Absolutely. Um, the book looks very different than any of his other books. Um, I actually have it right here. Um, the, the special edition of the, the Stanley Kubrick's The Shining from Tash, and it's a number of volumes, it's three volumes. Um, mm -hmm. But this red brick is the actual Jonathan's making of book. Wow. Oh, and it's fantastic. 910 pages. Oh, so good. A lot Can't of photos wait. in it too, but it's very, very text heavy. Um, I told uh, Benedict Tashin from the very beginning, I said, look, if we're going to do this book, I envision it being a very thorough, definitive uh, making of this film. And that means it's going to be a very text heavy book. And I know that Tashin traditionally doesn't publish text heavy books. They're very image forward. I said, if we're going to do this, I think there's a lot of this opportunity to have it be very image forward. But I also want to make sure that we're not, um, you know, skimping on the telling of the making of this movie. And Benedict from day one said, yes, absolutely. Let's let's make that book. And the designers in Paris uh, at MM, um, uh, Matthias and uh, Mikael, they they had previously done the Napoleon book and the uh, the 2001 book for Tash and, and they were also really excited about taking on uh, uh, something that was so text heavy. They'd never done anything like that. Um, and so it, it, you know, it all just came out really, really great. I'm, I'm super happy with it. Um, I ended up having to write pretty much all the captions in the book because Jonathan had passed on by the time we got to that. Um, but everything else uh, in terms of the text is, is pretty much a hundred percent, Jonathan, wow. 99 point. Nine five. With you well, and the and the I'm designers. gonna read the shit out of that thing. I oh, just like to yeah. say I can't I can't wait. I love I love those books and it's you know, unfortunately that you realize after, you know, reading the sort of standard I think that Jonathan set with a lot of his, his Star Wars books and you know where where he began, you realize how bad most of the most of the making of 
books are. So any kind of, as Dave said, any kind of serious scholarship that comes into them, you know, it's really, it's rewarding because right. that stuff is hard to find. That, the other thing that ended up happening, which I, I don't think either of us were expecting, um, was not only did this book become a day-to-day chronicling of the making of the film and, and its whole development and subsequent post-production, but we we ended up getting so much material about Stanley Kubrick and how he worked but from his family, from the people who worked closely with him. Um, you know, I, I didn't care what anyone's job was on The Shining. I was talking to grips. I was talking to electricians. Anyone who I could find, I would talk to because they all had stories. They all had yeah. interesting stories to tell. And you don't get the same kind of stories talking to just the producer, right. you know, or, or, uh, you know, just the DP. So, uh, we had a wealth of material about Stanley and, and, uh, Jonathan really smartly ended up structuring the book so that throughout the book, there are a number of sidebars that dive into specific things having to do with Stanley, you know, how he worked with actors, his approach to writing, how he dressed, I mean, all kinds of different <laughs> things. And so the book is, uh, is just as much about the making of The Shining as it is presenting a lot of new material about Stanley Kubrick, the director that I've, I've never seen before. I don't want to reduce a giant book. And by the way, perhaps the heaviest book on planet earth. Um, but <laughs> yeah, just block yourself with it completely. I know, just I yeah, put it right in front of you. There you go. That's the shot. Yeah. Um, oh, and here, by the way, I have copy number Oh, fantastic. You didn't yeah. get one? Right. They don't send you yeah. one? I feel 237, you Dave. Yeah. Oh, I guess you're right. You're right. I see. The room. I see. And I, I see. thought, well, I can't have one. I get I'm it. Have number yep. 237. I get it. That's get perfect. It. Um, <laughs> is there a If I said to you, what is the one thing you discovered or didn't know when you started that you found? Like, I, and I don't mean to reduce it to one thing, but I am always curious if you can, re- is there some fact or one thing that just like, just blew you away, shook you to your, your socks, like anything that just like that jumps out at you when I ask that? Well, lots. <laughs> yes. I, mean, I figured, I, like, I figured. Yeah. The, yeah. The one, yeah. I don't know how to do that. Um, one of the biggest things I took away from d- doing this is that the whole process really humanized Stanley Kubrick for me. You know, we all put him up on this pedestal mm. as being this brilliant filmmaker, which he was, but uh, he was a person who had insecurities and made mistakes and didn't always know what he wanted. And uh, me being able to dive into all his drafts and notes and everything showed me that, you know, I, I, I saw a lot of uh, reflection of my own process and, my own trials and tribulations making my films, uh, you know, where you just don't know what the hell to do. You don't know how something's going to end, whatever. And Stanley was going through the same things and the same struggles. So um, I know this isn't the kind of answer you were looking no. for, but that that really is truly to me one of the biggest things I got out of it. Now, that being said, yes, I found like some amazing stuff. I found things in the archive that they didn't even know they had. Um, I found... Um, I mean, this was a magical day that this happened. Um, you know, Stanley kind of famously had all of the outtakes of all of his films incinerated. And uh, because he he knew, you know, he was seeing what was happening with DVDs and he, he just didn't want anything kind of being utilized after he died that he wouldn't want to be seen. So he had his assistant, Leon Vitale, uh, burn everything. Um, but there was something forgotten, <laughs> which I found in the archive which was, um, you know, this, of course, were, were the days pre um, nonlinear editing. Uh, so Stanley, on several of his films, I learned, had these notebooks, he had these three ring binders, and he would have his assistants clip out a few head frames. Oh, from, and tape them in and then write. Oh, they, were in like like a, yeah. they were in like plastic sheets. Sure, sure. And yeah. if it was a moving shot, it would be head frames and tail frames. And it was so that he could see at a glance all his coverage. Uh, it wasn't every take. It was just just one of each shot, each setup. And I found these notebooks. Oh, and wow. I, I don't I don't think anyone really knew what they were. And I started looking through them on a light table through a loop. And I just about crapped my pants because I was seeing scene after scene that he had shot that weren't in the film. Wow. Uh, including the hospital. The F1. hospital. Yep. Yeah. So I ultimately made use of most of these images and um, because I thought it was important in the telling of the day by day production, you know, if we're talking about 
him shooting a scene where he finds a, an old scrapbook and shows it to Wendy. I don't want to just talk about it. Right. I want to see right. images. So yeah. I, I had continuity Polaroids, but now I could actually put in color stills. And, um, and of course, I, I knew if I was freaking out about seeing these images that anyone who was a fan of the film or Kubrick would also like be really happy to see them. So um, Tashin did an amazing job uh, retouching them because they were just pieces of work print. They sure. were scratched. They were faded. They, they were not, you know, preserved in any way. But Tashin made them look pristine and they are, you know, they're all in the book. Some of them are in the making of book, but a lot of them are also in the big oversized uh, photo folio, which is like a, a roughly 425 page book, one photo per page, this huge oversized book. That's the bulk of the weight of your of your package. <laughs> Very good. That so is... the, the hospital epilogue, because he yeah. destroyed everything, that doesn't exist anymore. Yes? No. Um, I mean, I I've spent a long time trying to track it down. It's kind of my holy grail to be able to see it. And I've had a, a couple of people claim they had some form of it, but nothing ever came to fruition. Hmm. Um, you know, there's a whole subset of collectors of, of film prints and, yeah. and yep. things like that. And they're very, very cautious about, it's almost like you're dealing with a drug dealer or something like they don't want anyone to know what they have. They're worried that the studio is going to come down on them. So you have to kind of practically go on the dark web to, to find these people. And um, so, you know, I heard that somebody had it, but nothing ever came of it. I, I had another guy I was chasing for a very long time who claimed he had um, um, some kind of rough video of it that he had got. I don't want to talk about how he had it, sure, but, sure. but that never ended up happening, you know? So I've, I've pretty much given up on it. I don't think it's out there. As the story goes, did, was it on cuts just in America or was it, did it go the whole world and they had to cut it everywhere. It was no. just in America. The film had only opened in limited release in New York city and Los Angeles. So we're talking so basically a cut, like one or two theaters yes. theater gotcha. in each okay. city. Uh, I actually interviewed one of the editors in New York city who was shepherded around to, uh, to cut the scene out of the film. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he just felt horrible. Like he, he wanted like confirmation 10 times that Stanley, he actually talked to Stanley on the phone. He's like, are you sure I'm cutting your film? He's like, yes, you need to cut this out. It was a scene that had been in and out in the cutting process. And Stanley wasn't sure if it should be there or not. And as I heard it, it was ultimately Stanley's daughter, Vivian, who convinced him to put it in. But then, you know, I think he had some regrets a few days later and, uh, and ended up deciding to take it out. Wow. And I've heard from, I, I've talked to people who saw it, you know, who saw right. the film in Los Angeles when it opened and, you know, they pretty much just shrug about it. They don't say it was like any great scene. I've read the scene. I've, right. I've seen the images so I can kind of imagine, you know, what it was like. Um, you know, a lot of the choices that Stanley made when he was cutting the film had to do with trying to not answer too many questions and be more enigmatic. Yeah. And, you know, he never wanted to tie anything up in neat little bows. And so a lot, some of what he took out, I think, was just for time and structure. But but a lot of it, I think, was to try to just be more, I don't know, to just leave more questions in the audience's minds. It's funny. That, I think, is also one of the things that runs through a lot of his more interesting movies is to sort of not over explain to, uh, you know, right. whether it's, whether it's leaving questions or just simply letting you figure it out or just simply being presentational, however you want to think about it. But definitely right. one of those things that runs through a bunch of his movies, you see it, you hear about it in, if, I don't know if you've ever read any of the various makings of 2001, mm -hmm. but it's a similar thing of like, what are we getting to and what are we saying it is and how much are we going to explain? And he fought about it with everybody fought about it with yeah. Arthur C. Clarke fought about it with, you know, his own people and just, you know, yeah. what, what are we going to say? What are we going to show? Which is interesting. So when they cut it was the instruction then cut it and then send it back to us, like bring it yeah. back so we can burn oh, it absolutely. basically. Oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he probably held on to it, but it, when he had Leon um, destroy everything, I'm sure right. that if he still had those, that those were in the batch of what Leon the, burned. Yeah. Once in a blue moon, I mean, not that this will ever happen per se, but you know, someone, I think Leon did follow instructions pretty well, but uh, you know, they, they, yeah, they found a couple of the, they found a couple of uh, 2001 models that were supposed to have been destroyed that someone didn't actually destroy. They're in the Academy collection now. Mm -hmm. So 
it's possible somewhere, somehow, someone someone didn't listen to the maestro and maybe someday something will- It's possible. Uh, yeah. I mean, I live in, having done this book now, I live in fear of more things emerging sure. <laughs> that aren't in the book. <laughs> <Right>. But <laughs> I don't know, after 12 years of working on this book, I-, I, I It's pretty thorough. I'd be yeah. really surprised, and 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 Tashin's already told me we we can try to get stuff in in you know future editions if if things come up. I wanted to tell you a quick story that's in the book that I love. Um, you know, Stanley knew that people you know dove deeply into trying to understand his films. He was quite aware, um, and uh, and I think it amused him. Um, and uh, there was there's a story that somebody told me on The Shining that he had shot a shot. They didn't remember what it was. But after they cut, Stanley turned to this person and winked and said, let's let the French film critics figure that one out. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. He was, He's, you know, people think of him as being very serious and, uh, yeah. you know, but and he was at times, but he was also warm and, and could be playful. Yeah, that's, oh, that's great. Did that's you great. in I, your because I actually think I know he didn't like to travel and I lose track of dates, but. You know, and he obviously he didn't come to America. I feel like he would have been fascinated by Pixar. Like if you guys were in the UK, he would have visited. In any in any version of overseas travel, did you ever come close, or did anyone from Pixar ever come close well, no, to the, he, the Kubrick no, world? He, he died. In he died before it. Okay, so it's right. It's, the only the only Pixar film that had come out was Toy Story. Okay, the first uh, one. A Bug's yeah. Life came out in ninety. Oh, I guess Bug's Life came out in ninety eight. So. So two films. Um, and I always wondered, I yeah. wondered for years, did he see, because I knew he was very curious and interested in new technology. I was about to say the technology alone, he would have had to have, I, I don't know. I've, but yeah. I, I don't know. I asked Vivian, his daughter, and she said, no, she said he wouldn't have seen that. He, he wasn't really interested in animation, but I still wondered because just because it was so cutting edge and, and, you know, he was interested in CG and how it could be used. Um, but it's funny years later, I, I actually had a dream. I'm sorry. I'm telling you my dream, no. but I had a dream that I was leading a contingency of Pixar people to England to meet with Stanley. It was like, it'd be like a meeting of the minds. And, um, and I, cause I was kind of leading it. I was like, I was having a conversation with Stanley at one point. And I said to him, you know, I've always wondered if you ever saw any of my work, but I've been afraid to ask because I, you know, I'm afraid maybe you didn't like it. And he paused for a moment in the dream and he said, well, there's always that chance. <laughs> so you got an enigmatic answer, even in your yeah, own yeah. dream. Yeah. And that's as far yeah, as it you went, really so. captured him. Well, I feel like I feel like Let if the Pixar French film critics figure that yeah. one out. If Pixar technology had had existed back in the day, I believe he really could have faked the moon landing in a really great way. That's what I I honestly believe. Do you enjoy, by the way, I have to ask, do you enjoy that part of it, like that sort of side craziness of Kubrick? Do you appreciate it or is it just nonsense to you? I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate the stuff that has some grounding in reality. You know, there's an essay that a journalist wrote about the connections between The Shining and the Native American genocide. And I know from talking with Diane Johnson that that was something they were talking about. And, and mm. there are things in the film that very clearly, you know, it's not what the film is about, but, it, but it's they, there. It's they in have there. an influence yeah. uh, visually and a little bit on some of the writing. So I know that that's real. But the crazy stuff, the moon landing stuff, the I mean, it's. It's just off the deep end. Um, I actually know the two guys, uh, uh, Rodney Asher and Tim Kirk, who made the film Room 237. Sure. And um, I, I was really interested in what they were doing, A, because it was about The Shining. I ended up giving them some money in their Kickstarter campaign to help finish it. Um, I look at that film as not, and th I know they don't either. They don't see it as that they're putting forward these ideas as legitimate. What they were interested in was exploring how people can go down the rabbit hole of overanalyzing films and art. Yeah. And that's what they were trying to do with that film. So on that level, I don't have a problem with it. I know that the Kubrick estate was very, very upset about it. Oh, um, interesting. Hmm. Um, the moon landing stuff and especially trying to draw any lines to the Holocaust with uh, the shining, which oh, is something right. that's kind of talked about in the film. Yeah. They're just like deeply offended by it. Huh. Um, but you know, 
I, I think it has a place in terms of uh, a marker of how relevant and uh, the film is 40 years later and how interested people remain in it. You know, well, I was also going to say about it. it's a compliment, dare I say. Nobody, uh, you know, just to talk about the three of us for a second, nobody's walking around going, oh, one of those three guys masterminded a fake moon landing. They would never think no. any of us have the skills to do it. And there's there's <laughs> no. something to be said for Stanley Kubrick could have faked a moon landing. I don't know. that that That's part of why I sort I of I wonder where the story it. Yeah. starts. It would be great to like do some historical forensics and try to figure out right. what's the who origin was that of person yeah. who made that up at the beginning of all this. Uh, who knows? Um, so you, I have a question. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. Well, I, I was going to ask, um, did, did you turn up anything great in the collectibles world through your amazing list of contacts and all that in the making of the book? Did the book shake anything loose in yes. the, uh, film memorabilia <laughs> world? Very good. Yes. Um, I was already getting into the film memorabilia world prior to everything having to do with the book. Um, uh, I can't remember how I first reached out to him, but at some point I wrote to Stephen Lane um, at Prop Store. I think back then it was called Prop Store of London. And I told him, you know, I introduced myself, told him about my work. And I said, look, I'm really into The Shining. I don't know if anything from The Shining ever comes up, but I'm hoping you'll reach out to me if it ever does. Um, because I, you know, I, I used to just sit and dream. Like I would think to myself, if I could have one prop from The Shining, what would it be? And, and it didn't take me very long to think, well, if I could own an ax from The Shining, that would kind of be the key thing to own. And then um, one day Stephen wrote you a note saying, I well, happen to have in my collection. <laughs> well, yeah. no, he didn't because oh. he didn't have it at that point. Um, but he did reach out to me, I think, while we were... I seem to remember it was while we were scoring. It wasn't Toy Story 3. It was some earlier film, one of the films I co-directed. So it was either Monsters or Finding Nemo, um, maybe even Toy Story 2. I don't remember. But he reached out to me and he said, I have come into possession of a few items from The Shining that I think you might be interested in. And thank God he, you know, he could have just been writing to say they're going to be going up for auction, but he didn't. He just offered them to me for a price. And um, I, I took the bait. And what it was that he was offering me in that first batch were, um, he had a slate, this oh, little wow. insert slate. Oh, lovely. Look at that. This is a That's slate fantastic. used for doing kind of like tight close-ups on yeah. things. Um, and he also had, and I about died when I saw what it was, he had Danny's Apollo 11 sweater. So Stephen I didn't even know was he, I didn't on, know that past. Stephen was in on the faking of the moon landing. <laughs> he did. Now we know. Now we we didn't Steven realize that. Yeah, faked the moon landing <laughs> so that sold so it, I, the props uh, sold to you sold <laughs> later on to the. Yeah. I ended up buying the sweater, and so I I own it. Um, I it's That's on kind fantastic. of semi permanent loan to the traveling Kubrick exhibit. Okay, so it's cool. been part of the show okay. for quite a while now. That's so I don't excellent. have it here to show you. Um, but I, what I was told at the time, because I was curious where these things came from, I was told that one of the assistant editors had bought it at the end of production because, like on many films, uh, they had a sale at the end because not everyone is George Lucas with right. warehouses to keep everything. So they got to yeah. get rid of stuff. And Stanley was all about money and you know being as frugal as possible. And so if he had an opportunity to make some money back at the end of the production from selling furniture and props and things to the crew, he you know he he would do it. So um, one of the assistant editors bought this sweater and took it home uh, to give to her nephew. And the nephew wore it briefly because children grow fast. And then it came back to her and it had just been in her closet for decades. Wow. And I probably someone at some point said, you know, you should sell this. You might be able to make some money. And, uh, and so I bought it and I, I now know who she is. I've, I've interviewed her and got to hear the whole story of, That's of incredible. Uh, how, how she came to Did sell it. Did she get it. a kick out of the fact that you have the sweater? I hope. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay, very good. much so. <laughs> very much so. Um, and then it was some years after that, that uh, Stephen reached out to me and again, um, I'm very thankful to him that it, it wasn't just him informing me of an auction, but it giving me an opportunity to uh, to buy this. Bravo. Yes. I was going to ask, did you ever get the axe? Oh, so yeah. glorious. Look at yeah. that. It's amazing. And, you know, it's a funny, th it's very heavy. It's, it's a funny thing. Um, uh, everyone talks about 
you know, every few years you'll see one of these axes coming up for auction. And it seems to, for some reason, again, people are interested in The Shining. It seems to get a lot of press. And they always talk about it as the axe from The Shining. Right. <laughs> but the reality is, um, you know, there were many axes. You know, I have a photo of, of, of a prop master with them all lined up. And in that one photo alone, I think they're like... 15 to 20 axes aren't there in the exhibit don't i remember seeing like five or six well, or something no, like that no that was something two, else two, yeah well i'll tell you what that is okay. so there were a bunch of hero axes um and i've been told i know where this came from um and i've been told it was one of the axes used uh, to chop through the bathroom door um there were also a number of foam prop axes to be used mm. in wide shots so Jack didn't have to carry a heavy axe all the time. And those have those are out there and come up for auction occasionally. Um, and then there were also a couple of uh, stunt axes, special effects axes, and those are the ones that are in the exhibit that you saw. Gotcha. Um, that were used for the scene where uh, Scatman Crothers gets the, the, the axe into his chest. And oh, okay. they were rigged with blood tubing and they, they designed a whole setup so Jack could actually swing it and, and chop into Scatman without hurting him. They actually cut off half the ax head and there were these little pegs uh, that would bite into uh, some fiberglass that uh, Scatman was wearing. And, and also blood could be kind of shot through at the same time. So it could all be kind of one action oh, wow. of the ax hitting awesome. him. Um, those, you know, I paid a tidy sum for this ax for sure, but it was also a pretty long time ago now. It was maybe... I don't know. It was like 15, at least 15 years ago that I bought it. Now the, the axes that go up for auction, the, uh, the, 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 the foam prop axes, I saw a foam prop axe Going sell for, for more, far yeah. more than I paid for one of the <laughs> real ones. You hit it, whether you realize it or not. I mean, obviously you're aware that these, your number was less, but you kind of hit it at a perfect time before the, perfect time. the yeah. auctions had kind of caught on. They because weren't a I, huge I do, thing. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. at the same time, dare I say, I was still occasionally being offered like Star Wars props without having to buy them in auction, which obviously is just a night and day, I mean, scenario of like, right. you know, it's just a whole different world. And now, of course, Everything goes into auction and is more. Another thing Ooh. I got at auction. Oh, yes. I remember, I remember the, this one being an auction. The yeah. big one. Now, um, there were actually two used during the production, and I now have both of them in addition Fantastic. to that little uh, uh, insert slate. Um, so, you know, what happened That's with these glorious. is at the end of production, each of them was taken home by one of the members of the camera crew, sure. his camera assistants, and they had them for years. And, and then ultimately, again, came to realize that they could make some money from them and sold them. So I, I one of the guys is no longer living, but um, uh, uh, Kate, who's uh, kind of a, a camera loader, um, she, uh, uh, you know, put hers up for auction, which is how I ended up getting that one. And the only other thing that I got at auction um, was this. Oh, wow. Oh, great. Which is, which is Wendy's knife. Yeah. Um, or, or one of them. Um, I have never seen a picture of more than one, but you know, for key props, there are always repeats. Sure. Um, you know, because if something breaks, of course, you need to have another one sure. on hand. So, um, and I was told that this came out of one of the original ho uh, Planet Hollywoods. It was on display for oh. many, many, many years. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, that's good. Um, and when they closed, some of the stuff went back into circulation, and this ended up at auction. Yes, it did. Uh, is another one. The only other one I know of is in the the Kubrick exhibit. So, wow. do you think is that an? Uh, do you think that's an off the shelf uh, item, or is it is it sharp? Yeah, yeah, it is. I yeah. mean, I you know, I'm sure they dulled it's dull. They dulled I'm it. Sure for they the, dulled yeah, it down. But it was. Yeah, Shelley Duvall was handling it. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for years there were these knives that purported to be from The Shining that would show up on eBay. And they were all from this company called Nor Norank at Elstree. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that it's all baloney. I mean, I, I, I dug into it and I started reading a lot of very sketchy stuff about not the company, but the people who kind of inherited it and started kind of marketing things that supposedly were, you know, came right from a workshop at Elstree. Yeah, um, not to, to keep it as, uh, I guess, as legally proper polite. as possible. There were some, yeah, there were some issues with some other genre movies like that shot there, like Star Wars right. stuff that, right. fr quote unquote, from the movie, but 
were they question mark so, question I, mark. so yeah. I always passed on these knives yeah. because hey I don't need a knife that was hanging in the background of a scene um and b I you know I was I was dubious of them even being from the film um but I did get this when it came up now there's another category of what I have um I don't have any of them here but I, I guess you'll show some pictures I have a number of costumes from the film and those I all I, I mostly came into um, once I was kind of working on the book. Although when I think about it, uh, no. So I bought I, I bought the sweater I talked about the Apollo Eleven sweater, and then I subsequently found a guy. I, I guess there's a whole website of people who are prop collectors, and sure. they they have pages and show their stuff. And I found yeah. a guy yeah. who had um, the the one of the coats that Scatman Crothers is wearing, the big winter coat when he gets axed. <laughs> and I ended up making this guy an offer and I bought that coat. Um, and, and I now know the whole provenance of that. You know, it came from one of the stage hands and he had taken it home and his mother had washed all the blood out of it. And I was going to, I was going to ask blood stain or no, no, but no, no more gone. Blood stains, yeah. But, um, but they, before it went up, uh, before he got it, they had opened up, the, the 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 gash that had been sewn shut so i have one, i have that coat all righty fans i'm here with my brand new co-host bart hey bart uh hey, Dave. ryan ryan's replacement uh much more amenable to you know i think working with me and the whole contest thing and uh i think you're gonna really love them uh it's it's really i think the show is gonna really take off to a new level and we're here with an ad. Uh, many auction houses offer COAs with your purchases, but in the world of props and costumes, where there are no third-party grading systems, there's only one COA that really means something. Tell them, Bart. It's the... You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Ryan's not going to be happy about this, but uh, I'll, I'll do it anyway. It's, uh, it's the industry standard. Prop Store COA is considered the gold standard in the world of props and costumes and certifies that the item you are purchasing comes from a trusted source and that Prop Store has done their research to confirm it's authentic. That, that is so much better than Ryan would have done. That's right. Whether you're a buyer or seller, the Prop Store COA adds value to your entertainment collectible and it features a money back guarantee. Propster COA actually comes with a money-back guarantee. Well, that's the same thing twice. Propster stands by its research, and if a buyer demonstrates the guarantee of attribution is materially incorrect, Propster repays the original purchase price to the buyer. That was a mouthful. Take it away, Bart. Transferable. The COA is transferable to each new owner of the piece throughout its lifetime, and each of those new owners will also enjoy the security of its guarantee. Each COA comes with a serial number and photo that is registered in Prop Store's database. If you buy an item with props with the Prop Store COA, you can always call or write Prop Store to confirm an item's authenticity. Back to you, Dave. This guy is a fucking natural and the secret creator of House of the Dragon. Uh, between you know, just for our audience, you should Don't know. Don't tell that. my secrets. <laughs> so when you're buying or selling items, uh, would you want Brand X's COA or Prop Store's? We think, me and Bart, that the choice is clear. Go to propstore.com to find out about Propstore's guarantee of attribution and find out how to buy and sell through Propstore. And don't forget, and this is really the most important part, go to propstore.com today to place a buy now order using one of our exclusive discount codes for, and vote for your favorite, the Stuff That Dreams Are Made, stuff that dreams are made Of podcast host. Use Dave10 or bart 10 but what you don't ever want to put in is ryan 10 i just want to be really clear about that dave 10 or bart 10 which will send you bart 10s will be counted as dave 10s you don't want to write an r at the front the only r can be in the middle for bart no dave 10 or ryan 10 get 10 percent off your buy now purchases now through the end of the season please note this discount code is not valid for auction purchases or sale items Support Prop Store and the stuff dreams are made of by making your buy now purchases today at PropStore.com. Anything else you want to tell the people, Bart? Yeah, Ryan's going to kill us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I will say that I, I, I also have one of Jack Nicholson's um, uh, maroon oh, velvet wow. jackets. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Um, I have the sweater that Danny is wearing at the end of the film when he's running around in the maze. In mm -hmm. climax, um, I have the Bugs Bunny shirt that he's wearing in the opening <laughs> scenes of the movie. 
um, and a couple other minor things. But, uh, uh, I, you know, I never sought to start collecting all this stuff. It really, it was like, if I could have an ax, I'd be happy. <laughs> I could, I, I'd be done. But That's when how it all things, starts, Lee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, my collecting has not... Um, you know, spread beyond the shining or. Well, that's, I was going to ask, yeah, I was going to ask, did, did, like, did, do you have you been tempted? Else? Is there, yeah. is there no, no, because okay. I, I very much have that collector's mindset and have that yeah. completist mindset. And so I could see myself getting into trouble. Have you really ever, quickly. have you ever not bought a shining item that has shown up in auction and regret and are you still regretting it like is there one that kind of escaped you whether it was price or just like oh, i don't know and now you're like oh i should have bought that or no you grabbed them all there were things that i passed on um none of which i regret really um there were a lot of documents and photos that went up for auction over time sure. and what i would do in those cases if it wasn't something i particularly wanted to spend a lot of money for I would reach out to the prop house afterwards, explain who I was, that I was writing this book and ask them to put me in touch with the winning bidder. So and that you could at least see them or be a part of the book, but not necessarily own them. That's Yes. Great. Yeah. And in several cases, mm. they agreed to scan their documents sure. and photos and send them to share them with me. I give them credit in yeah. the book. But um, one thing that I passed on was uh, Stephen had up for auction uh, the bed. Uh, Jack and Wendy's bed in their caretaker's apartment. You, I mean, it's in a lot of scenes. It's it cool. is. It's it is. It's a yeah. bed. Thought, it's a big bed. What the hell am I going to do with this? It's going to sit in a storage unit. You know, I'm not going to sleep in it. It's not going to be in my house. You could so build I, the I, Overlook I, Hotel around it, Lee, and make piece. a big yeah. display for the bed. No. So I passed on yeah. that. And I think some British pop star ended up buying it. There was some press <laughs> about it. But a good thing came out of that because Stephen, now when he does his big uh, auctions, he will often set up a display at uh, the, the Odeon Cinemas in London, like out in the lobby. He'll have a lot of key props on display for the weeks leading up to the auction. And this bed was set up. Um, and, and what happened was uh, they were doing, I think they were setting everything up. And this guy walked up to Stephen and he said, hey, he was just there to see a movie. And he said, hey, uh, what is all this? And he told him and he said, I see you have this thing from The Shining. I, I worked on The Shining. And, the, and Stephen said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, it was Danny's stand-in. <laughs> and, and, and I knew that Danny had a stand-in, but I mean, how the hell do you ever find that person? So Stephen reached out to me and said, hey, I met this guy. I don't know if you're interested in talking to him. And I was. And so I got in touch with uh, with Justin and um, he had lots of stories to tell. So like I, to my point of like, I didn't care how tiny somebody's role was on right. the film. Everyone has stories and they're often very interesting. Like if they remember stories, it's probably because they were interesting stories. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's just fantastic. fantastic. Um, just to ask about a couple of key people and obviously say what you want to say, I, I'm prefacing this with, a, I'm giving you a lot of escape room. So take, take it as you will. Uh -huh. um, Stephen King, let's start with him a second. Cause obviously he's sort of famously not a fan. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something you talk about in the book? Is it addressed? Did you talk to King? Tell us anything you want to tell us. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. I mean, we talk about that in the book. I mean, I have a memo from Warner Brothers from right after Stephen King saw the movie for the first time. And the memo says something to the effect of Stephen loved it and he, he will only have good things to say to the press. <laughs> but that changed yep. down the line. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, he famously did not like the film. I have a lot of ideas about why he, he, he didn't like it. Um, there are things that he talks about, but I think there were deeper things having to do with the book being elements of it being autobiographical and a lot of struggles he was going through with uh, substance abuse uh, and, and having young children. And I mean, he even talks about there were times where he felt violent. He never did anything, but he felt violent towards his children and that scared him. And he ended up exploring some of that in The Shining. Um, and so the fact that Stanley changed it so much, I think he ended up having a big problem with on top of him just not agreeing with Stanley's choices about making a scary movie. Mm. Um, but you know, what, what ended up happening without going into great detail on this, um, when I was relatively early in, uh, making this book, I had been granted access to all of the archives at Warner brothers, all their corporate archives having to do with the shining. And I was starting to make arrangements to visit the archive. And all of a sudden my 
my emails went dry. Like they, like I, they wouldn't communicate with me anymore. It was just nothing. And I didn't know why. And it took me a while to finally, um, reach back out to someone I had talked with originally. And, uh, he was an attorney there and he said, look, we, we found something that you need to know. We found out that, um, uh, Stephen King's contract when, when the book was first optioned, um, uh, states that any written works having to do with the movie over a certain number of words have to be approved by him. Oh, and so boy. he said, unless you, he said, we're not going to reach out to him. If you somehow have access to him and can convince him to let you do this book, then great. Whoa. Otherwise it's dead. And uh, it was a really fraught 48 hours. I have to tell you, it was very, very scared about the whole thing crumbling out from underneath me. And it, and yeah. I had done a, you know, a lot of work already on it. Um, long story short, I ended up, uh, finally getting in touch with Stephen King and he, I won't say begrudgingly, but he very simply gave me permission. You know, he, he, he said something to the effect of, I, I don't like this film, but I don't have you, I don't have a problem with you writing about it. And so that was my only interaction with him. I would have liked to have talked to him, but he just really, I don't think he has anything more to say that, that he hasn't already right. said about how he feels about it. So I'm thankful to him. I mean, listen, I was a huge Stephen King fan after The Shining. I've like read everything voraciously, yeah. huge fan. So like it would have killed me if he ended up killing my <laughs> dream project. It's fantastic that he, he didn't. didn't kill it, I guess. I mean, no. that's that's as, yeah, that's fantastic. as good as an interview that he didn't yeah. kill your book, um, which is sort I of I will say, Mr. King, actually one of, I think, our probably biggest celebrity fan of Colony, my, my the show that I did for the USA Network uh, that ran for three seasons and was totally desperate for an audience. And I have to say, I, I, I give him credit. He, he like tweeted about it every week and God bless him. But I, I don't know what it, I don't know what it was. It just, it seems like a weird thing because it was not a horror thing, but he yeah. just, he saw everything that we were doing. He saw the subversion of it and how, the, yeah. you know, the, the commentaries that we were doing and he totally read into it and got out what, what we wanted to do. And, uh, I'm just, you I'm always deeply appreciative of that. think he got the sense that you didn't care for the Kubrick version of the shining as well? Well, I mean, I picked up on that. Off, yeah. Yes. All the, all the time. <laughs> and I said, I said, but one day I will read the making of book. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, I, he's I, good uh, about that. He's good about like tweeting about stuff he reads or sees that he that's exciting. Yeah, and he, he's not like just talking about what everybody's talking about. I mean, sometimes he does, you know, does he was a big lot, you know, he's a big Lost fan. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I created Colony with Carlton Cuse, who was also involved with Lost. So they, they had a relationship and they knew each other. Um, but he was, you know, as Carlton always said, he would not be doing this if he didn't actually like the show because he's written me before quietly on the side saying I didn't I didn't this wasn't your best work on uh, on other things. So, um, yeah, I don't I I I, I don't know, but um, it was just it was super cool. And, uh, you know, when you obviously when you put yourself out there and do something like this to have uh, someone I read all, of, you know, all of his yeah, books. Who and was that, and, influential on yeah, you, like yeah, inspired yeah, you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Very cool. Cujo put me off of dogs for a good part <laughs> of my uh, my my young preteen years. So um, did yeah, you uh, were you able awesome. to reach out to like, if you will, the bigger stars, your Jack Nicholson's and whatnot, like any mm -hmm. uh, like willing to like do a email q a or anything like that or answer any questions i did i did uh, jack nicholson did not end up um participating in the book i i got very close to him you know i was corresponding with his personal assistant about everything and um he just you know jack doesn't do press he doesn't do interviews if it's not press for a movie he was in he just didn't do interviews mm -hmm. uh he, he just kind of can't be bothered um uh that said um, Jack's voice is very much throughout this book. Like it doesn't feel like he didn't participate because he's spoken I, in the well, past got, about it. Yeah. I got my, I got my hands on a few key things. Um, Vivian Kubrick, you know, she made a documentary on the making of the shining, um, at the very end of production, she interviewed, she sat down a bunch of folks and interviewed them. And she did a very lengthy interview with oh, Jack wow. Nicholson. Um, little bits of it are in the finished film, but I got my hands on all of that footage and the uh, transcripts of it. Oh, wow. Um, so that that was the, the key thing to get because yeah. it was fresh. He had just made the film. Um, and then several years ago, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, um, Steven Spielberg guest edited an issue of Empire Magazine, the British film magazine. Mm. And as part of that issue, he had this idea to revisit The Shining, or specifically Jack Nicholson's uh, time on The Shining. So 
Stephen basically called in a favor to Nicholson and said, please participate in this. So Jack agreed. He did this interview and um, I reached out to Nev Pierce, the journalist who had actually interviewed him. And um, we hit it off and he ultimately ended up sharing the complete transcript of that interview. Oh, that's fantastic. With me. Was this close? And Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask, was this when Spielberg was sort of recreating the Shining sequence in that no, movie? No, many, it had nothing to do with that. Before, before that, before that. Ready gotcha. Player One. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but that kind of told me that Spielberg was a fan of The Shining. So that was interesting. And I, mm. you know, that came to bear later when I uh, reached out to him. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to billboard. He does the introduction for your book, correct? He does. He, yes. wrote, he wrote the foreword yeah. for the book. Yes. Um, oh, so anyway, uh, between those two interviews and some other interviews and bits and bobs through the years, um, Jack is very much a part cool. of this book and there are a million pictures of him that have never been seen before. Um, I spent many years trying to find Shelley Duvall. Uh, I finally tracked her down. She's a little bit more visible these days than she had been. Um, I went and spent a whole day with Shelley. Oh, wow. uh, we, we sat in a Red Lobster restaurant and in uh, Texas. And um, I showed her footage and photos she'd never seen. And we just talked about her whole experience. It was lovely. She's, you know, people, it's, it's well known that she's been suffering from mental illness for a number of years now. So that, you know, was a bit of a challenge from time to time. But I found when she was talking about the past, she was clear as a bell and, um, and had a lot of great memories. Um, I also spent many years trying to track down Danny Lloyd, uh, who played Dan, who played Danny. And, um, I knew that he was a, 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 a professor at a community college in oh. Kentucky. That's all I had. And I literally at one point was going through faculty rosters on the internet of, <laughs> of community colleges throughout Kentucky. And lo and behold, I finally found him one day and I sent him an email. I didn't hear anything back for a long time, but I finally got a, a mail back from him. And he basically said, he was very cautious and he said, look, I, I, I normally don't talk about that time. Um, uh, you know, I try to be professional in my work as a professor. Um, he said, can you do anything to like prove to me that this is a legitimate project? Um, and I, so I ended up having Jan Harlan reach out to him and Jan vouched for me in the project. And then Dan opened up and uh, that started a great relationship, oh, many wonderful. interviews. Um, I ended up ultimately, he introduced me to his parents eventually who were both living, who were with him in England. And they, um, you know, talked with his mother, Anne, a lot, uh, great stories. And um, interestingly, at some point after I found Dan, he started doing a little press. He would do like autograph shows here and there and donate the money to charity. And I saw, an, I have a standing Google search on The Shining, so every day I, I see stuff, mostly there's nothing, but occasionally something important pops up. And I found this interview that he had given to a British newspaper. And in the article, there was a photo of him, like they'd gone to Kentucky and taken a picture of him in a cemetery for some reason. And he's holding a photo. Um, and I looked at the photo and I could tell it was like a behind the scenes photo in the snowy hedge maze. And it was something I'd never seen before. So I reached right back out to Dan and I said, what's the deal? What's that photo? And he said, oh, I took it out of my parents' photo album. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I subsequently talked to Jim and Ann and they said, yeah, we, we took a lot of photos on the set. And I ended up going oh, and visiting wow. them. And I looked through this photo album and I, that was one of those like crap my pants moments for sure. Um, I, I was just seeing dozens and dozens and dozens of photos, A, that I'd never seen and B, importantly, that uh, documented aspects of the production that I knew were otherwise completely undocumented. Um, Stanley basically told Jim, Dan's dad, look, you can take pictures. I don't care. Just don't ever sell them. Um, and this is pre-internet, you know, so yeah, you don't have the worries that you do now. Right. Um, so I tentatively asked, do you happen to still have the negatives? Because they were faded, very faded. And they said, yeah, they're in a trunk in our basement. So they ended up sending me about roughly about 450 35 millimeter negatives. <laughs> oh my gosh. Mostly That's color, so some black and white. That's and a book really, in itself. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, it was at that point that I knew that I had the book because there were a lot of photos in the Stanley Kubrick archive, but they only covered kind of specific moments in the film, kind of bigger set pieces that 
mm-hmm. people thought it would be interesting to take pictures like all the 1920s extras in the in the gold room um but I, I worried. I worried that I wasn't going to have enough visual material. I was turning stuff up from other sources that was helpful, but it was when I found the what the Lloyds had that I, I mean, the, the dam just broke open and I knew that we were going to have an amazing book at that point. That's great. Wow. That is fantastic. Wow. So when, if Stephen Lane had called you and said, I've got a photo album from the parents of. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, listen, they, you know, they, they knew how secretive Stanley was and, and they never gave interviews to anybody, right. you know, Yeah. Where if it wasn't approved. And even now, like, <laughs> they're also like caught, I mean, they're, they're open with me, but they're very cautious about talking about anything as if like Stanley's going to overhear them and not approve. And it wasn't just yeah. them. I, there were other people there. Right. Everyone who I reached out to uh, agreed to talk to me, except for one person, one of uh, Stanley's other assistants um, uh, named Andros, uh, this bigger than life Greek guy. Um, he talked to me on the phone, but to tell me that he wasn't going to talk to me about Stanley because he knew that Stanley was going to be up in heaven looking down and saying, Andros, why the fuck are you talking to this person? <laughs> I'm sorry. You can bleep that. I don't know if you have a swearing on your prop show. No, no, um, no. Fuck yeah, away. This is, yeah. yeah. This is adults um, only. So he, was the, he was the only one who wouldn't talk to me, but everyone else uh, happily talked to me. So it was wonderful. And I was oh, going to say, spoke, about I'm the assuming. Photos, oh, well, one last mm. thing about the photos. Yeah. When the book was all finished, I did some back of the napkin math because I was curious. I went through the book and I counted all the photos and documents in the book. And uh, because I know where everything came from and what's been public, I determined that of all the f- images in the book, with the exception of actual stills from the finished film, 75% of the images in the book have never been published before. Wow. And of that 75%, a very healthy percentage has never been seen. Now it has a bit because I've been doing press and people have seen stuff. But prior to the book coming out, only a handful of people had even seen uh, most of the images in the book. Sorry, I interrupted you. That's incredible. Um, No, 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 no. It just, it, it is that thing of like, you know, as you put it, it's a Toshin book and you want it to be graphic, but. You know, it's like you've got both. It's like even if it had no pictures, I think it would be incredible. But it sounds like you found these pictures that are just insane. Now, I was going to ask, honestly, I'm assuming you you mentioned the assistant. We talked earlier about uh, his other famous assistant. Uh, um, No, I was thinking about that. Was it Leon? Leon Vitale. uh, Yes, who there's the documentary about. I'm assuming you spoke to all of them during their yes when obviously they were with us and whatnot yes yeah. well leon i mean that's another tragic loss you know leon just died at the yeah. end of the summer um leon uh was extremely helpful to me with this book oh, i wow. spoke with him a number of times i sat in person with him for a very long day um, he would reach out to me and ask how the book was going. Um, he helped me on a few other matters having to do with the film when I was trying to track things down. He was the most kind, generous, thoughtful person. And I can't think of a better person to have been the shepherd of of uh, kind of making sure everything was being done the way Stanley wanted it after Stanley died. Um, I, I mean, I really grew to like uh, Leon quite a bit and, uh, you know, it was so tragic um, when he died. I didn't even know he was ill. Um, I now am friends with somebody who was very close friends with Leon. And I kind of heard the whole story of what happened. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thankfully the book hadn't gone to press yet. It was just about to go to press when he died. So I was able to add in something extra in my acknowledgements, oh, kind of noting nice. that he had passed on. But I mean, I almost wanted Leon to see this book more than anybody. Yeah. Because he really he, believed in me. He believed, he believed in what I was doing. He he had faith that I was doing it right. And uh, it just kills me that he isn't going to get to see it. So he and Jonathan both just, it's, you know, I guess that's right. part of uh, the downside of a project taking as long as this is taken. Because yeah. we actually lost yeah. a few other people from the cast and crew that I did get to interview in the course of making the book. Sure. That's wild. Um, the other thing I wanted to pick up on was uh, you mentioned Spielberg in your travels, if you will. And again, I'm not even talking about people that you necessarily spoke to or not, but, uh, you know, 
when I think of Spielberg and obviously he has a relation, he had a relationship with Kubrick and obviously he finished AI and now there's talk that he's going to, I don't know, produce or direct or the Napoleon is going to be something now you're hearing about. Um, in, in your travels, were there other, I don't know, forgive the word, famous fans of the of shine of the shining that kind of popped up into your world like like the the like the like the the british musician that bought the bed is he into the shining or does he just like beds do you know what i mean like i don't know is it did it did it no not much i mean i'm sure there are plenty of celebrities who are really into the film um you know i talked briefly with jordan peele i know he's a you know he's a Mm. really big fan of the shining um uh, you know, I talked, I had a whole lunch and talked extensively with Mike Flanagan, uh, yep. Dr. who Sleep, directed yep. Dr. Sleep yep. and on top of all his other work. Um, and so, you know, he's a huge shining geek and we, like, we had a great time talking together. Um, but no, I mean, sometimes I'll meet somebody and it'll come up what I've been working on and it'll turn sure. out that they're, you know, a big fan. Um, but I had heard that Spielberg had been on the set. I don't know how I heard that. I can't mm. remember. He may have mentioned it in an interview at some point. So I reached out to him and um, and ended up, it took a while, but I ended up landing an interview with him on the phone. Um, and uh, I could have hung up the phone after the first 10 seconds where he told me how much he loved Coco. And I would have been done and happy. And just print that, um, print that right in the Shining book, right on page four hundred. <laughs> Steven Spielberg about the Shining said, "I love Coco." The yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I had met Steven a few times over the years at different awards things, and you know he would talk about how much he loved what we were doing up at Pixar. But that was kind of the extent of it. But so this was an opportunity to have this long phone call with him, and he you know talked all about you know, what happened and meeting Kubrick for the first time on the set of The Shining. And I ended up putting all his stories in the book. Um, and at the end of that phone call, I asked him if he might consider writing a foreword for it. And he, he was very hedgy about it because he said he's, he's asked to do things like that a lot, but he very rarely does. Um, but he said, this is this is Stanley. This is The Shining. It's a movie I love. So he said, why don't you reach back out to me when the book's all done and I'll read it and, uh, and I'll let you know. And he said, if I say no, don't be offended. Um, but I, so when we had the layouts all finished, I, I sent it to him and, uh, and he loved it. And uh, after some conversations, he, uh, he agreed um, to participate. So we ended up having a whole other conversation over Zoom, which is awesome. I had like another hour and a half conversation with him uh, where we dove in just a little deeper. And, um, and then ultimately, uh, you know, he, he wrote the, the foreword for the book as it is. And um he says something at the end of the foreword that I like. I, I had to pinch myself when I read it. He says something to the effect of, um, you must read this book. And I don't care if you've seen it 50 times. Um, uh, oh, no, sorry. He said, you must read this book. And the moment you finish the book, you need to watch The Shining again. And I don't care if you've seen it 50 times. You'll never see the movie the same way again. And, you know, he's kind of he's right. I, you know, I. I, I made the book and I hadn't seen the film in a while. And when I was over in uh, London for the, for the launch of the book, um, we had a screening at BFI and uh, it was the first time I'd seen the film up on a big screen in a while. And, you know, he was right. Like I, I now, when I watch the film, I see all the scenes in between the scenes. Like I know mm. what they were and where they were. And I've speculated about why they're not there anymore. And, and uh, you know, has it changed my perception of watching the film? Sure. Has it ruined it? Not at all. Um, but I definitely have a different relationship with the film now, having done this project. And now anyone who reads the book will, you know, have basically my experience of learning everything that I learned in the course of my research. And I have no idea when this is going to air in relation to what day it actually is or was or any of those things. However, you are weeks. doing you're hosting a screening of The Shining at the Academy Museum in L.A., mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At some point soon, that the date is, I don't know. Yeah, it's but next month. It's next month. So there's mm-hmm. a chance these things line up. So if you hear this and you're in the LA area, check the Academy Museum schedule and it's possible the screening hasn't happened yet. It's and on March 17th. Look at that, March 17th. There Again, we don't, night, we don't know. March this is probably 17th. airing March 18th and you've just missed it by <laughs> a night. But, it's, the weekend, um, uh, it's the weekend after the Oscars. 
Um, yeah, I'm going to okay. be, they're going to have a screening of The Shining in their big new theater at the at the museum. And before it, I'm going to be Which is fantastic, giving a, yeah. yeah, I'm going to be giving a talk about kind of how the book came to be and, you know, share some images from it and tell some stories. Fantastic. Uh, awesome. I'm going to do my best to actually come to that. I'll be the one guy in a mask, but uh, that, that'll, <laughs> that'll be me. Um, although actually you get a pretty old crowd at the Academy screenings. They, they're pretty good about the masks and stuff. So anyway, uh, I just they will that... be selling the book as well that night. I'll have a go. number of copies in the, in their bookstore. Um, you know, for people who don't know the Tashin sometimes does deluxe collector's editions of their books. Not yeah, not with many, but I, you know, I'm very grateful that they wanted to do that with this book. So they did this big, beautiful um, collector's edition of only a thousand copies. Uh, you know, it's a little pricey. It's fifteen hundred bucks, which uh, for avid collectors they maybe don't even blink at that. But for a lot of people, it's completely out of their price range. Um, but I can people can be rest assured that Tashin will subsequently do a trade edition at a much lower, more affordable price point. So everyone who's interested in this should be able to ultimately enjoy it. Or as crazy collectors like to say, that's the one we read as opposed to this one, which we don't like to touch as much because right. it's so special. You kind of don't yeah. want to you don't want to like handle it too often. So, yeah, that becomes the the reader copy uh, later on. Yeah. <laughs> which is kind of great. Um well, come to that screening uh, if you're if, if this date matches anything. I think that would be very cool and important and fun. Um, and will you sit and watch the movie afterwards, or, or have you seen it just at this point too many times? <laughs> I probably will because a number of my friends are going to be there who are LA based, yeah. um, and I'll want to you know hang out with them after. Uh, it will be a little close to the BFI screening. Not that I don't mind watching it. My wife definitely doesn't want to sit through it again anytime <laughs> soon. She has a much lower tolerance than I do. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely stick around. I think they might be having me sign books in, uh, as well afterwards if anyone wants to uh, well, that's sell if you, if a $1,500 book with my signature. If you miss the screening, they'll have some for sale maybe in the bookstore. So that's, uh, that's a good thing to know. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, anything else, Ryan? I can't think of anything else. I have one I other... Oh, go ahead. That the, if anybody hedging that theater is really incredible, and it's I mean I would say for you, Lee, it's worth that alone because the, the I mean the theater is just I my my favorite theater in L.A. to see something was, used to be the um, the Academy Theater on uh, on on Wilshire, the one right next to uh, old Kate Mantellini's. I just felt like that was the best picture and sound. Like I never saw anything in there that wasn't just perfectly attuned, and I think. Um, I think the Academy Theater is just is, yeah, it's is pretty just it's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. And this is yeah. um, this is this 4K transfer and restoration of The Shining is is gorgeous, it's really yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, very very cool. Um, I just wanted to say before we end, and I do mean this. I mean, I a obviously thank you for writing this thing. There's something fantastic yes. about. I guess. I love the movie. I don't have the, the same relationship with it you have, but you have written the book that I want, which is what I, I love. That's my favorite thing in the world. You wrote a book for yourself and I want that book, which I love. Yep. But more importantly, and I do mean this from the bottom of my heart, thank you for not loving Star Wars in the same way <laughs> and buying props and stuff from it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very important. I want to thank you for that. You said something <laughs> that is, is apt and true. Basically, this is the book that I long wanted to be in the world and no one was making it. And so I made it. Yeah, it's 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 really the best. Those books are the best because it's like you made it for yourself and your standards of what this book needed to be are exactly what I want it to be, which is a wonderful I, thing. Yeah, I used to tell people while I was in the middle of it, that the the fact that there was going to be a book at the end of it was kind of tangential almost it was what what i was in it for what were these yeah. opportunities to meet the these people talk to people who had been there all of that um in the end i'm very happy that we have a book of course as well yeah yeah well unbelievably great. fantastic uh, well done congratulations yeah. thank you um super exciting uh, I think we need to play the game, right? Yeah, Dave? we like to. We, I don't know if you've seen the show. We uh -oh. like to play a game. It's sort of a prop collecting game. Usually, picking a movie, sort of uh, what what your what dream piece could you have, or in some cases, if you already have something else. Um, and I mean, I do sort of feel like I'm. I'm kind of curious about almost two versions of it. One, of course, would just be 
not the shining what other kubrick prop you'd want to own in your collection okay. but i also am curious not counting what you already have because obviously you have incredible yeah i think that's the more straight up one but i am curious do you have a second favorite kubrick movie let me just ask that question before mm, okay. before we get to i just curious do you have a a number two even if it's a great distance like the shining's up here and this one is your second but do you have a second favorite well it's, it's definitely 2001 okay um, I mean, I don't think The Shining is Stanley's best film. I think it's his most popular film. Mm. Um, but, you know, 2001 is his masterpiece. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So do you so, think that's uh, also his best film? Do you, is, yes. Despite, okay. Yeah. 2001. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and in terms of having a prop from that, um, you know, I don't know. I tend to like, I like the idea of having like little side props that, Maybe I notice <laughs> that nobody was going to care about. I can't think of anything from that though. Um, I, geez, I don't know. I mean, I'm friends with Adam Savage and he's really into, uh, you know, replica props. Yes. He'll I mean, build you, he'll build you whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. And I, he's really into 2001, of course. I don't know. I mean, to have like, I don't even know that they exist anymore, but to have one of the original Hal, um, kind of yeah. eyepiece the templates would, panel would, of would be, pretty be a, cool. a holy grail prop to have for sure. Yeah, that's pretty damn And good. you were asking about like, if I could have a prop from the shining, it, that I don't. Yeah, what, what's yeah, missing? what prop yeah. do you not have from the shining? Even if it's in the Kubrick collection and you don't have it, what would be the one thing missing from your collection, your dream other piece? Obviously you've got the ax and if perhaps that had ever been the only one, you'd have been a happy person, but we, it's never enough. So what's what's the dream piece you don't have? I, I'm going to give you just a few because uh -oh. I don't know that one rises okay. above the other. Of what's in the archive, they have two things there that would be very cool to have. Uh, one is he they, they have the two the dresses of the Grady twins. Yep. Yeah. Um, that, that are part of the Kubrick exhibit. Yep. Um, um, but what they also have in the archive that aren't in the exhibit are all of the original typewritten pages of all work and no play makes Jack. Oh, wow. Boy. That'd be pretty amazing. Um, and actually as part of this deluxe edition, the, the, the third volume is a box of ephemera and it looks like Jack's typing paper box. And when you open it, I gave the reader copies of all about 115 <laughs> of the original typewritten pages are right there in the box when you open it and there's other stuff underneath. Um, so yeah, it would be cool to have that or have a piece of it um, in terms of just a random prop that I can think of. Um, I, I've actually thought about this. <laughs> I'm, know, I'm guessing you have. I'm I'll, actually, I'll that does not surprise me. Let me say that. This is not a shock. You've thought about yeah, it. Yeah. And I, <laughs> the only thing I can think of, I mean, I could probably come up with a list, but the one that I know that I've thought, well, that would be interesting to have is the, uh, the, the shortwave radio that's in, oh. um, the oh, manager's right. office yep. that went, Wendy uses to speak to the Rangers and Jack later opens up and kind of destroys so that she can't communicate with anyone. I actually put that radio in toy story three in a scene. We had a scene with this, uh, one of those chimp toys with the symbols. Yeah. And, yeah uh, that guy. Yeah. He's sitting and looking at some monitors and we, we, we did a kind of a recreation of that radio from the shining sitting on the That's desk. Great. I have to go back and look now. If <laughs> someone ever said to you, this is a prop from the shining Stanley Kubrick made me burn it, but here's a bottle with the ashes. Would you be interested <laughs> in those ashes? Yes or no? <laughs> no. Okay. No. Well, if I could have anything from the shining, it would be that story. What about you, Dave? <laughs> I mean, I'd love, I mean, I'd like to hear that story before I die. But, uh, I, you know, I mean, look, obviously I'm going to skip Axe because he's got, I mean, oh, there's other Axes, yeah. but obviously, and I think we've talked about before. There are very few of the real ones. Right, I mean, the real I know, ones. I know yes. where they all are. Right. And I, I'm only aware of maybe five or six. Out but I mean, even a stunt, even whatever, I guess I'm just mm -hmm. passing. I mean, it's the definitive prop, but I'm passing on it simply because you have that one. And I, again, even if it was another one, um, I, I think we've talked about like, you know, I know there's multiple versions. Obviously the photo is really, really cool. And there's a yeah. lot of versions of it. Um, obviously I'm sure they're, they're in the archive. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. in the archive. And those yeah, are that really would be a cool thing to yeah, have. That would sure. be really neat. I was thinking about, you know, you mentioned the paper, which I really liked, but I was thinking if you could also have it with the typewriter would be really cool. The, the actual typewriter, yeah. The typewriter no longer exists. No longer exists. Burned. Mm. What about a jar? Know. What about a jar of typewriter ashes? <laughs> the, they have a typewriter in the Kubrick exhibit that but they kind not of claim to be, but it's not. I know that it's not. Um, 
the last photo I saw of it, I have a photo of Vivian Kubrick in her cutting room when she was working on her documentary and she was just using it as her typewriter in her office. And so I asked mm -hmm. Vivian about it when I met with her and she, she just had no recollection of whatever happened to it. So it's either sitting in a cabinet somewhere at the Kubrick estate right. or it's in a landfill. I don't know. But yeah, nobody knows. I guess it. it's, I don't know if it's better or worse that it didn't get, you know, sold for $6 at the prop set, you know, like, like, oh, I could use a typewriter, you know, that kind of a thing. But, uh, oh, yeah, I, the typewriter would be really cool. I mean, if, if it, if it existed, the typewriter with yes, paper absolutely. in it would look just insanely yeah. So amazing. see, there, there yeah. you go. You're yeah. naming a bunch of stuff that yeah. I would kill to have. Yeah. Yeah. The typewriter and the paper. That's a great answer. I think as a writer, that's probably what I, I was about to say. For. I love how it ties into yeah. that part of the movie, which is the, mm -hmm. the creative process or the issues with the creative process, I guess. Yeah. One I think things. I don't yeah. long for those because a, I know the typewriter isn't anywhere right. and B, I know that all the paper typewritten papers are in the archive and not going to yeah. be in anyone's private hands anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It completely makes sense. Um, fantastic. I don't know what else to say. Just, just incredible. Uh, well, I, yeah. besides, besides the, uh, uh, Lee's untold story, I would say, uh, if I can't have the typewriter, I would say, I don't know if Lee, if you picked up on the, my, my, uh, my wallpaper, it's not the right, uh, color, but it is the, it is the, um, crazy octagonal oh, yeah, it pattern. Is. I didn't even notice. Cause yeah. I, I, until I leaned yeah. in close. Yeah, yeah, it'd be cool to have a swatch of that. It's a all section stuff, of the carpet. Yeah, yeah, I, all, I think I, got, yeah. all those sets just got, they got just ripped apart and thrown in a landfill at Elstree um, because they were yeah. they were trying to clear those stages so Empire Strikes Back could Right, because he was like, they were way behind, right? Yeah. It was like a race exactly. to basically so break I, that all down. I talked, yeah. to, um, I talked to Ben Burt, the sound designer, and he told me stories about being at Elstree uh, right after The Shining, and he just saw all these set pieces just like ripped apart and in piles in this kind of quasi landfill. And he he, he was even heartbroken then, and the film had just been made. Right, he hadn't yeah. even seen it yet, and he knew right. like this is not good. Yeah, um, now we can't all be George Lucas with a big uh, <laughs> warehouse of wallpaper and rugs. Archive but, uh, yeah, stuff. That'd be pretty darn cool. Um. Lee, this is amazing. Yeah, uh, this thank is incredible. You so much. Everyone, go um, to your local Toshin store or go to Toshin dot com and buy this damn book if you can go for the fifteen hundred dollar version, or wait and buy the other version later. But goddamn, get this either book. way. Yeah, uh, and then watch the movie, like Steven Spielberg says. Always listen to him. I so, will yeah. say, having having been a part of these limited edition uh, pre orders uh, a number of times because I'm I'm a collector and I cannot help myself. Uh, through through Toshin, um, what usually happens is that it, it's it sits there for a month, and you can just click order anytime you want, and everybody just gets lulled into the sense of like, oh, you know, it's expensive. There are a thousand of them. I'll get around to it. And then basically the day it comes out, and people start seeing it online and seeing the reviews of it, it just goes. So I would say if you're if you're hovering over your mouse. Mm -hmm. Um, I would, I would just go ahead and buy it now. Cause I doubt that it, it comes out in March. I think officially, I doubt that it survives the month of March. And it technically speaking is a collector's item unto itself, which is really a yeah. short way of saying buy two, buy two, one to keep <laughs> that's right. and then one to resell later. I mean, that's the real, I mean, that's the real prop collector's motto here in this case is buy two. You think really. it's expensive? Double yeah. it. Double it, $3,000, <laughs> you get two. Later on, you sell that one, pays for the whole thing, except you never sell it because you think to yourself, it's pretty cool, I've got two of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Why stop um, at two? Yeah, that's no, right. three, then you have two to keep, one to read, one to and never really take the cellophane off of, yeah, and then one to sell later. So there you go. That's right. <laughs> um, but uh, but yes, thank you for joining us. Uh, this was amazing. Um, uh, is there any place that, is, does the Overlook Hotel website still exist? Can they yes. reach you there? You Fantastic. can either go is to it... theoverlookhotel.com or just overlookhotel.com. They both work. Excellent. I haven't put anything up there in quite a while. At some point when I knew the book was happening and I was getting my hands on all this stuff, I, you know, I wasn't going to just put it up on the website. I had to save it for the book. But I have had a number of people tell me that uh, the site was kind of really invaluable to them for research. Even Mike Flanagan told me, like, he would go through the site. And, oh, yeah, so I'm glad absolutely. it's out there. And, um, you know, I'll probably... Now that the book is coming out, I'll probably start putting some other images up 
um, you know, or at to least a, to or at least product. a link, a link to order it. That's that'd be a good use of your time, maybe. Yeah, yes. just something to think about. Something to think about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't even think to do that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> there you uh, go. And you're on uh, you're on Twitter too, and you occasionally put little uh, tidbits up. I believe. I am on Twitter yeah. though. Since Elon bought Twitter, I've kind you of kind of like, moved haven't away. Really been uh, on don't blame me. Right, I'm kind enough. of transitioning over to Instagram. Mode, there you go. And Instagram. But the bulk Perfect. of my followers are on Twitter, so I still need to throw some stuff out there sometimes but he just made it so much less fun unfortunately uh and what is your twitter uh at so or your instagram Adam? your pick <laughs> they're both the same it's at lee Unkrich, my full name l-e-e-u-n-k-r-i-c-h good and uh yes you can reach us on all of the social media uh, platforms uh even the bad ones at props podcast and uh, as always, you can email us at dreams are made of podcast at gmail.com. And watch us on YouTube because we'll put up some pictures of some of the yeah, costumes. Yeah, and you'll and see Lee holding we, up his he amazing couldn't, uh, hold shining up, collection. But you get to see his shining collection. Otherwise, you'll see some stills where we can put them. But uh, it'll be this, this is a good one for YouTube, but dare I say, another good one for YouTube because you yeah. just get to see some cool stuff. Um, fantastic. I don't know what else to say. You guys keep trying to wrap this up, and we still We keep going. We keep going. There we go. They're just going to play us off now. Uh, but uh, thank you, Lee. And uh, as always, uh, join us next week on the stuff dreams are made of. Bye.